right? So it's 11 on dot, um, 13 people in the waiting room. Um, I'll open it up at 14 now. And I'll open it up in five seconds. Okay. You let us know when we're ready to go, Pete. Yeah, good to go, David. Okay, great, excellent. All right, well, here we are, uh, Thursday the 4th of February, and uh, we are very pleased to welcome uh, Carita and James uh, as we uh, deliver a webinar for everybody regarding uh, Victoria University of Wellington's use of uh, GitLab. Um, and this session will be, uh, you know, really giving you an overview of how from the academic perspective, uh, the, um, the platform has been used. Um, before we kind of get into that though, and before I do some introductions of James and Carita, um, I just want to kind of go through a little bit of housekeeping stuff. Um, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, so if you don't want your voice recorded, then you need to stay silent. Um, hopefully you'll happily ask questions and won't be shy uh, as we get into the panel discussion. The slides from this presentation will be uh, emailed out to everybody who has joined the session. Uh, and if you do have any questions during the presentation, then you, uh, if, all you need to do is type them into the chat box and uh, um, we will uh, read those out. Uh, or if you want to voice it yourself, then we'll give you that opportunity uh, later in the session uh, toward the end of the session. So let's uh, just quickly uh, go through and do some introductions. And I've just realized I've lost my introduction slide of James and Carita. I don't know where that disappeared to. Um, so in the absence of me having that to talk through, what I will say is that uh, um, we've had the, the pleasure over the, uh, the last several months of building up to this, of uh, working with um, uh, James Quilty, who is the program director of the School of Engineering and Computer Science at Victoria University of Wellington, and uh, Carita Escott, who is a former student and now assistant lecturer, soon to be a PhD herself as she undertakes that venture, um, working on uh, not only preparing this program, but gaining a much deeper understanding of their use of the GitLab platform um, from a teaching and learning perspective. So I think uh, I've got a few more intro comments to make um, and then I will hand over to them to do their own additional intros and um, we will kick off. So as far as the overall agenda goes, uh, we'll go through getting their perspective. I'll then uh, quickly give you an overview of the outline of how GitLab is uh, kind of providing for universities in terms of the licensing programs that we run. We'll then have the open panel discussion and move into uh, any closing remarks. So uh, quickly background uh, for me, um, probably my claim to fame as far as education and technology goes was uh, I had the good fortune to work at Methodist Ladies College, which is a fairly exclusive girls private school in Melbourne. And uh, we were the first school in the world to compulsorily introduce laptops in uh, 1991 for fifth graders and we were working with Professor Seymour Papert at the uh, MIT Media Lab, who was one of the founders. Anyway, that's a long-winded way of saying I've always had a passion for uh, what technology can do in education and I think this at the tertiary level is an awesome, awesome example. So uh, moving on, a couple of quick points about GitLab. Um, I would usually, if this was an interactive session, ask people to guess what they think the numbers are, but uh, in the absence of having that interaction, I'll just kind of explain it. Um, I will say by uh, you know, any standard in terms of the varying uh, companies I've worked across in the tech industry that GitLab is by far the most transparent uh, corporation I have ever experienced. Um, you know, we have a, a handbook which is essentially the company operating manual which you could freely go and explore 
and find all sorts of fascinating details. It's 8,000 pages or thereabouts now, I think. We are at our heart open source. So we have GitLab Community Edition. Some of you may be very aware of that and probably using it. Um, the 1365 is a reference to uh, employees and the number of countries in which uh, the employees are based. So uh, work out that order of uh, complexity. Uh, and in fact, uh, both those numbers are slightly outdated now. And the 3000 plus is uh, active contributors to uh, code uh, as far as GitLab uh, versioning or rather GitLab releases goes. And we actually do a, a new subversion release on the 22nd of every month. I'll talk more about velocity uh, a little later into the uh, uh, GitLab part of the presentation. Um, I think if you're thinking about, uh, you know, kind of why GitLab exists in the market and what we're here to do, it is really, I think, best summed up by, uh, you know, uh, Mark Andreessen's uh, broad commentary in the market, but I think this in particular uh, is a pretty good example um, of uh, explaining, uh, you know, just uh, what we're uh, aiming to do, which is really help organizations move at the pace that, you know, technology is enabled um, and uh, do that with velocity. Uh, and uh, as you'll probably know from your own organization or others you might have a view into, uh, the sorts of environments that we tend to see and that I think that you know, the, um, the team at uh, VUW are preparing their students for look like this um, in terms of you know, a tool supply chain that is uh, unfortunately not as integrated as it might be. Um, you know, GitLab's view of the world is very different. Uh, we, as you can see uh, across the top, have a single platform that caters to all of these functional requirements from managing all the way through to uh, release, uh, you know, config, monitoring and defending. Um, and uh, over time, uh, what organisations are realising is that whilst they may sacrifice some point, uh, you know, superiority of a tool, um, the benefit of being in a single platform dramatically outweighs, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, loss of the, you know, 10% uh, that they're missing out on in um, unique functionality. Just a, another quick kind of touch on the transparency piece. The company again publishes this uh, level of detail on our website and whilst you can't click on these here, all of these uh, you know, uh, uh, functional uh, descriptions are actually clickable on the website. So you can drill in, you can literally see in any particular dev cycle where we are at uh, as far as what we're delivering against on any given uh, you know, kind of sprint cycle or whatever the uh, uh, activity is. So that level of transparency is truly you know, kind of there for you to see and do your own planning around. Uh, historically, you know, the company has continued to deliver really substantial uh, growth in the platform in terms of what the platform is uh, capable of supporting within your organization. And I suppose from an academic standpoint, what that means is your curriculum is probably going to continue to expand, uh, James, <laughs> which is a good thing, because the students that you're sending out into the workplace are going to need to be ready to, uh, you know, embrace that. I think uh, from the GitLab point of view, uh, that is probably pretty much all I wanted to say. Um, and uh, I will now happily hand over to uh, James and Karita to uh, do their introductions and uh, start their part of the session. So uh, James and Karita, I am gonna stop sharing and uh, invite you to uh, start sharing. Okay. Thanks, David. So, um, as David said, then thank you very much for the, um, the kind introduction. I am the Engineering Program Director um, at Te Heringa Waka Victoria University of Wellington. And Karita here, had, I had the great pleasure to have her as a student in my class and now as a colleague. Um, and so, as the title slide indicates here, we're going to talk about our reflections on, um, on GitLab and undergraduate teaching. Um, from both sides. So I'll give my, my staff point of view and Karita will speak to her experience uh, as, as a student using GitLab. Um, so our context really informs uh, quite a bit why we chose GitLab, why we settled on GitLab. Um, so just to take it from, from the top, um, we're one of eight universities in New Zealand. Uh, we have a School of Engineering and Computer Science 
that offers a BSc and a BE degree. I'm going to talk mostly about the BE, the Bachelor of Engineering, because I'm the Engineering Program Director. Um, we have a variety of majors. I think there are the real um, the real key point here is that we have a diverse cohort, and I will be touching on that later. Uh, and our environment's quite unique as well. So we are located in the capital city of New Zealand, located in Wellington. Um, we have a center of government here and a really, really strong local tech industry. So uh, our graduates go to places like Weta Workshops, who are famous in the movie industry. Uh, they go to Zero, the online accountancy firm. And we even have uh, a, a student, so actually one of my students who's graduated and is now working as a DevOps engineer at Rocket Lab uh, up in the Mahia Peninsula, launching rockets or help launch rockets. So we've got a, a lot of stakeholders here. We've got a very diverse cohort uh, and we need to meet the needs of all of these stakeholders. So the objective that we have um, as a school, one of the objectives is to teach engineering project management to undergraduate engineering students. And why do we have this objective? Well, engineering graduates are expected by accreditation uh, and by employers to have knowledge and, and skills in engineering project management, the, the capacity to work within a managed project and understand what's going on, um, to have some skills in teamwork uh, and operating in different modes within a team, to have skills with modern team tools and modern practices around projects. Um, so my role in, in all of this, uh, before I became even engineering program director, was to develop and deliver the project management courses uh, within the school. And at the time that I started this, there was actually no preferred technical project management infrastructure. So we started with nothing. And, uh, and this is the story about um, how we settled on GitLab. So one of the, um, one of the things that we have uh, here you know, to fulfill this objective, uh, one of the things that we settled on was to choose real world full year projects with external clients wherever possible. Um, as a possible way of meeting that objective of teaching engineering project management. Um, but this choice didn't solve everything and led to its own challenges. And, and we had the big three challenges, or I as a staff member found the big three challenges, um, which, uh, which are listed here, the individual versus group work tension, um, the theory versus practice tension, and the unauthentic versus authentic assessment. Uh, and those challenges link with each other as well. So just to talk about the first challenge, and this perhaps arguably is the most important and the biggest challenge facing me as a staff member, is that, um, as you can see on the, on the left there, most students see themselves like that. They are individual students assessed individually on short individual assignments. Um, they solve the problem, they are graded, they receive the grade, they move on to the next piece of work. And so this is really important. It's the educational environment that they've come from prior to joining the university. It's the educational environment they find themselves largely in within the various courses within the university as well. Um, but it has a lot of, uh, of important effects when we're trying to go from individual work to what we see on the right, students working together as we would expect within the workplace and as employers expect the students to work. So the, the whole structure and, and background leads to this perception that, um, that engineering students sometimes have of their professional engineering work as being something that will be um, a body of, of labor divided into small non-interacting pieces that they work on individually and contribute at the end and somehow it all just comes together. So their part, their role as professional engineer is to solve small technical challenges and of course, I'm sure that um, those of you who are coming from industry um, and our employers know that that is absolutely not the environment that we're working within today. It's not even the environment, the academic environment that we work in uh, these days. We have um, a situation of highly coupled collaborative teamwork, and it's only going to go more that way. So the idea of the hero coder, that's so 20th century. Um, part of this as well that, um, that does tend to make this a, a really big challenge is that the students are very instrumental about assessment. When everything is that their, um, their entire degree is writing on are the grades and the marks that they receive for the assessments, they look very, very carefully to what is asked and they try to meet that. Uh, and so then they take a, a view either consciously or unconsciously that the assessment is the learning itself, assessment as the learning. 
And, you know, one of the things that we, we want to get away from is actually that. And one of the ways of doing that is having that practical project that's long, complicated, requires management to actually force students to move away from individual work and move to interreliance and collaborative work that we, we need a professional engineer uh, to fulfill the graduate attributes and to fulfill employers' need. So I spent a fair bit of time talking about that first challenge. Uh, I do think it's a big one. I think that it informs the second challenge, which we have, which is the theory versus practice challenge. Uh, we have to deliver both. Um, but, you know, the project management theory, well, let's charitably call it uh, not the most popular topic for a software engineer or, or an electronics engineer. Um, you know, you think about classic project management um, and you think about planning documentation, the whole PM box thing, scope, time, quality, cost, risk, all of those knowledge areas. Um, that's all good. And the theory is important, but the theory only is actually not really of interest or value to students or employers. And that theory can feel really disconnected from the day-to-day -day technical work that the students perform in their courses and perform in their employment, because many of them have part-time jobs or have internships. Um, and so it can feel irrelevant. So we need to have a way, you know, this challenge and this tension of introducing the theoretical ideas that we need to as a university, while also uh, having modern tools and practices. And modern tools and practices are, are hardly a um, hardly without their own problems because um, specific tools and methodologies date rather rapidly. Uh, and it's not the role of the university to teach specific tool use. Rather, we teach broad theoretical ideas as well as modern tools and modern practices. So the solution that, um, that we came upon here is to take a practice-based approach, a practice-based professional learning approach to, to the course where we marry both the theoretical aspects and expect a practice in terms of repeated uh, performing of a particular uh, particular activity to build and maintain a high level of skill, a high level of professional skill. Um, and look, the DevOps loop that we see there is a really good example of practice, and it's a really good example of an expression of modern uh, modern project management, good project management. You start with planning. Um, so you start here with planning, and then you go on to do the building, the execution, the create, and then you, you map monitor your quality, you verify, you evaluate. It's a, a, key, a key attribute of a, an engineer. And then run through the, the rest of the cycle, and you keep doing it. Uh, so you practice, and you keep building and building. Every project is, uh, is built uh, iteratively. So uh, again, this does require that big, long project. But we're talking here and we still haven't really addressed this issue of there's no existing project management infrastructure. So the third challenge that we have, and that does link into the, the lack of a, an infrastructure is assessment. And I've already mentioned that students are very, very cue sensitive to assessment. And we've got, I'm sure everyone will, will recognize the unauthentic assessment that's, that's very academic, but feel false uh, and pointless. You know, Formal documentation for a software project is not what we're doing these days. Um, reports and essays on your experience, a reflective report, is also not really a particularly authentic way of assessing your experience on a project. Even examination of the final product or artifact um, doesn't tend to assess the student's performance, and that's what they really want. They want their performance to be assessed and have feedback on that. Um, even the final, the final artifact as a, as a monolithic whole doesn't really allow that. And so all of those things really, um, really lead to that instrumentalism. If we ask for an essay, we get an essay. We don't necessarily build the skills that we're looking for in terms of modern project management, modern software development, modern development of um, software and hardware. So what we do want to assess and the authentic things that we want to assess are things like issues, milestones, actually documentation, you know, documentation management. Um, Milestones and epics, the, the management of time, uh, the management of scope, branching strategies, how do you keep things under good version control? Um, how do we assess that you have followed good continuous integration? So we need to find a method of assessing that practice. And without settling on a particular piece of infrastructure, it's actually rather tricky. And that's where GitLab rises to the challenge. Um, so we started in a, a vacuum and tried a, a variety of things. And then when I found out about GitLab, I thought, aha, this is great. 
it's self-hosted, which is important for our external clients, but it's an all-in-one application. And when we say talk about all-in-one, um, we're not just talking about the technical. So it's not just that it does all of these technical things all in one, important as that is. It also allows the non-technical aspects to be captured as well. It really does become, uh, in, in the project management terms, our single source of truth. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm prone to tell the students, if it's not in GitLab, it doesn't exist. Um, just to reinforce that idea that GitLab can and should contain everything to do with your project. So it enables as well, by design, meaningful teamwork practice because it's built on the, that DevOps lifecycle. It's built on that, that loop that we see here with the modern tools and practices. So by design, it enables exactly the first thing that we want to get away from individuals and into group work. It also provides us sophisticated project management features that marry nicely with project management theory. Um, and it enables authentic assessment because as an all-in-one application, we have access for assessment to the practices that the, the students are following. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is a self-hosted on-premises application, it alleviates problems with the access for assessment um, because we have the control. Uh, it also ensures confidentiality when confidentiality is required. Now, we really want students to follow the engineering design process, the think it, plan it, build it, as, uh, as our School of Engineering's uh, slogan goes. And that's really, really nicely expressed by the DevOps lifecycle. So you can imagine how happy I was to find how well GitLab actually gives me the expression of project management in a, in a 21st century context appropriate way. So what you see here is GitLab is an all-in-one solution showing the GitLab workflow. This is from a blog post uh, a little while ago. And as you can see here, this is good basic project management. You come up with the ideas, right? You document it, you plan it, you plan it in scope, you plan it in time. Then you do the te technical execution. You share it, you commit it, you get it under good version control. Then you evaluate how well it's done and control all of those aspects of the, pr of the project. And then you get it out there. So um, it's, it's a really good way of, um, this idea of GitLab workflow is a really good way of introducing the students to not only modern practices, but actually good project management in a way that feels authentic. The thing is, you know, and I did have a little bit of experience with this, is if you don't say, use this, if you say, use whatever you feel, then you get one team choosing some, one making one set of choices based on what one, two or three team members have experience with. You get another team who make a completely different set of choices. Uh, and then, not only do you have this problem of, um, as you can see here in the diagram, of if you don't have GitLab, which has this horizontal integration here across all of those aspects of the DevOps lifecycle, you have all of these weird interactions going on between the different tools that you choose, this tool chain tax, and the cognitive footprint that it places on staff and students is just huge. Now imagine that's just one project. Now you've got 18 projects. So going to GitLab as an all-in-one solution really made life simpler, not only for the students, but also for the staff. So um, it also allows some insights into student practice. So we want students to follow good version control and we can talk as lecturers, as staff about good version control practices and continuous integration and we do in lectures. And of course, then assessment instrumentalism kicks in and the students go, uh, what's, in the, um, what's in that test? What's in that assignment? Um, so here's a really good example from early on where version control practices were kind of followed. We've got Frank Fun Branch, which was not merged. We've got Ben's Branch, which is individual work, not associated with a piece of, uh, a piece of project work. Uh, we've got Frank's Tears, which presumably was not the most fun of branches. Um, and, and there's work sitting on these branches here that aren't merged that wasn't really wasn't really integrated. It was just wasted work. And Ben's branch, well, who's, who knows what's that related to um, in the broader, the broader scheme of things. So um, one of the things that we don't see, and this is actually quite a historic example, we don't see this now at the end of our projects. And the reason is that we are able to intervene earlier because we have the insight that GitLab affords and make corrections prior to the end of the project. Um, some other insights that uh, we can have are from, for example, the tile view or the value stream analytics. So the value stream analytics are over here on the right. These give staff good insight to students who are regularly con contributing, which is what we want. Good tile view there. And the lovely thing about the tile view is it encompasses not just the technical commits to Git, but also all of the management aspects as well. Uh, and then we've got a student who perhaps needed some practice at um, 
at their continuous integration. So it, it's good to be able to see that. It's good to be able to see that for staff. But the beauty of GitLab as well is that these built-in analytics are available to the students and can give continuous feedback to the students as well about their performance. And I should mention also that the API allows a really deep insight um, into individual practice. Getting onto the GitLab API and pulling out event information allows staff really deep insight into what students are doing and how they're following the, the different practices. So just to, um, to finish off my experience as, uh, as a staff member, just to, to talk about our current use, GitLab started as, as really just being used in one, one or two courses that were, were looking at the project, teaching the engineering project management. Now we actually have courses from second year to fourth year, not a lot, uh, predominantly only those that are involved with, um, with project-based courses uh, and predominantly in software engineering. But we do have grown from a, a pair of courses to being a set of courses across a number of years using GitLab for their coursework. It's also used by some staff to store and manage their course materials. And the more complicated the course, the more that GitLab is required. Uh, and also used independently by staff and students to, to store and manage their assignments. Uh, and also the future use we can see from the trends that there is going to be wider adoption for research and also for administration. And we are already seeing the school's operational side, uh, our professional staff are beginning to move their the, their code uh, that actually operates the school and the various school websites into GitLab to use GitLab. And, and this is a really good time to, to mention that the school is running a, you know, completely self-sufficiently, uh, our GitLab. And that's really enabled us to meet objectives that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to, to achieve or we might fail to meet. Um, you know, by necessity, our school is really unusual and has some very high uh, demands in terms of IT autonomy to do the things that we do as a school of engineering and computer science. And really, it wouldn't be reasonable of us to expect any central IT uh, service to, to accommodate all of the unique things that we do and all of our unique activities. So we are able to run our own service that, that indeed we do. Um, in collaboration with our central IT service, um, who provide the, um, the virtual machine, but we run independently. Uh, and so we are able to have that autonomy that we need and run our own instance, uh, which is a really valuable thing that GitLab has given to us as a, a self-hosted on-premises application. Okay, and that's probably enough talking from me as a, as a staff member. I could go on, um, as Karita well knows, because she's been my student, but now it's time to pass over to Karita for her perspective on, um, on, on the, uh, the student side for, um, for learning this stuff. Thank you, James. Please. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko whakapuna ke te maunga, ko wairo te awa, ko Ngāti Kaihununu te iwi, ko Karita Rose Scott to ko ingoa, no mōhoa ahau. Uh, kia ora koutou, my name is Karita Rose Scott and I'm an assistant lecturer in the School of Engineering and Computer Science at Te Heringa Waka. Uh, as James mentioned, um, I was a student of his a few years ago um, and actually I took part in the project management course uh, that he was discussing. Uh, I joined the school as a staff member two years ago, and I've had the, the unique experience of using GitLab first as a student uh, and now as a, as a staff member for both my, both my studies and my teaching. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about the student experience. So the project management course uh, was my first hands-on experience with the DevOps lifecycle. Uh, we, we worked as a part of a team on a real-world year-long project from start to finish. Uh, and at the start of the project and in that point in my degree, I had pretty basic programming skills and was somewhat aware of uh, the general steps in a project. Uh, however, I had no experience uh, working in a team or working on something for such a long period of time. Uh, so there was definitely a lot of learning to be done, uh, both technically uh, and in terms of the project management aspects. So I was on a team of six students uh, and all of us with ranging but, but pretty limited uh, skill sets and experience. And our project, uh, funnily enough, our project was to develop a project management software uh, for an engineering company who wanted something uh, simple but specific to, to them to help them manage their own projects. Uh, and we were quite lucky in that we had a very engaged client uh, who had a very clear uh, vision of what they wanted. And they were realistic about our abilities, uh, but they were very encouraging and supportive of us uh, throughout the project. So that was really cool. Uh, so at the start, um, a year long engineering 
project with other people felt quite overwhelming. Uh, so James mentioned earlier that as students, we're used to working on uh, short individual projects where we work on them, submit them, and then we don't think about them again until we see our marks. And so this idea of think it, plan it, build it at this point it really is, uh, you know, I'm presented with some small problem. I'm going to think about a solution. I'm going to try build it as best as I can, and then I'm done. Uh, when realistically, in, in real world projects, you go through uh, many iterations, uh, and as you can see, there are many steps to be considered. So throughout the course, we were tasked with taking some high level concepts and ideas of projects management, uh, projects and project management, such as planning, testing, uh, integration, time and risk management, and so on, and putting them into practice. Uh, in any software project, there are a number of tools that, that facilitate the successful delivery of a project. Um, however, at the time, as a group of students with very limited knowledge, uh, making decisions about uh, all of the different tools and platforms uh, felt quite daunting. So uh, the use of GitLab really enabled us to experience both the technical aspects of our project uh, but also the management aspect uh, provide, by providing a tool that allowed us to, uh, to do the planning and the management alongside our technical development, alongside our CI CD pipelines, uh, which took some of the pressure out of making those decisions. Uh, we still had to, to make a lot of decisions that had good and bad implications for us throughout the project. Uh, one thing we consistently did was we relied heavily on the experience of our one team member who had had an internship over the summer. Uh, the rest of us had no uh, industry experience at all. Uh, and one thing we had to, to decide on early on in the project was the, the language that we were going to use to, to develop our, our software solution. And I remember deciding as a team that we would just use the, the language that our strongest team member was most familiar with. Um, despite the fact that the rest of us were similar, uh, were more familiar with something else, um, we, we made that decision based on her. So luckily for us, she was a, a pretty good teacher for a third year student. Um, uh, but I think it's, it's fair to say that while, um, while she was able to help us along, making decisions based on your strongest programmer and not on the project itself. Uh, it's not only bad practice, but it was also really risky. Uh, if she had left us at any time, uh, we would have we would have really struggled to, to even finish, I think. So, um, so yeah, students don't always make the best decisions. <laughs> and so one of the other things we, we did despite, uh, you know, despite being taught about it in class was we, we neglected to uh, decide on a branching strategy. So um, alternatively to Frank's Fun Branch and Frank's Tears, I think the other one was, um, our branching strategy was to use no branches at all. Uh, all six of us committed directly to master uh, whenever we felt like it. Um, and uh, all six of us doing that uh, with no real uh, pattern or idea what we should be doing, uh, it led to some pretty interesting code uh, merge conflicts. And in addition to that, we, we not only didn't use branches, but we also completed some, some pretty rough code reviews. And I think uh, looking back, I'm not sure you could even call them code reviews. Um, and although merge conflicts can happen and do happen in, in any project, uh, our solution to send each other code via Facebook to resolve those conflicts, uh, definitely not a good idea. I think it's certainly something James wouldn't have been impressed by at the time. Uh, and you definitely couldn't do in, <laughs> I definitely couldn't do an in industry. So uh, on, on top of that, we, we also didn't really think about a production environment until, until towards the end of our project. So we knew we needed to deploy the software in order for our client to, to use it. Uh, but we figured there would be a problem for later on. Um, so as you can tell, even though we're provided with all the, the information and tools that we need to take the concepts of, of DevOps and project management and put them into practice, um, yeah, we, we didn't always make the best decisions. So as I mentioned before, there were a lot of uh, lessons to be learned as a student at university. Uh, in an engineering context, um, the project really built on and supported the development of new skills that better prepared us for joining industry. 
And GitLab really supported that development such that uh, it was able to provide a tool for that al allowed us to collaborate and, and put our theoretical knowledge into practice together by working on a, a real world project from start to finish. So as a tool, GitLab really supported that learning for us of the DevOps lifecycle in a practical sense, uh, even if we didn't really implement uh, the steps properly. So in our project, we were able to use GitLab from start to end to plan our iterations of work and work together as a team. Uh, it was especially important when we weren't able to physically be together in person, which turned out to be a lot more often than we initially thought. Uh, and we were able to create a backlog of issues to keep us on track uh, and engage with different aspects of the project uh, in the same repository. So James mentioned earlier about being able to manage the project um, as well as the technical stuff in the same place. Uh, at the time it was, we might not have really realized or been even appreciative, uh, but that really was quite important to us that we didn't need to be swapping between learning different tools. So as a first time working for an extended period of time uh, as part of a team, we were able to create that, that one source of truth in the repository um, while, we, while we attempted to engage in best practices. So using GitLab to manage our technical work and the project itself allowed us to experience an engineering uh, project in an environment where not too much effort was needed. Uh, from us to learn how to use the tool. And although we uh, made mistakes along the way, lessons were learned and in the end we were actually able to successfully deliver a software solution for our client that we could be proud of. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I will now pass over to David for the rest of the seminar. Excellent. Hopefully you've uh, got me back again and you can see the uh, screen that I'm sharing. Awesome. Um, James and Carita, that was excellent. Uh, I, I think I'm going to steal the hero coder uh, comment, James. I love that. You know, I'm sure it is actually still a thing. Um, uh, I've uh, spent some time in a few large companies that sure remain nameless and, uh, you know, it's either the hero uh, ops person or the hero coder that still seems to exist in some organizations. So anyway, um, I think uh, uh, it was fascinating actually just um, uh, hearing the story of, uh, you know, the journey that you've been on um, and, uh, uh, you know, where you've landed in terms of how the platform has really enabled, uh, you know, you to do uh, a whole lot of things that otherwise would have probably been uh, much more complicated. Okay, so I'm going to spend just a couple of quick minutes. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out to a company called Integration QA. They've been a phenomenal partner for us as we've been working to build some focus around, frankly, supporting universities uh, just, uh, you know, uh, in embracing what GitLab can enable. And I'll talk about how we're doing that uh, in a second. But uh, if you haven't heard of Integration QA, I'd certainly recommend uh, making yourself aware of them and the work that they're doing, uh, certainly a lot in universities, but also beyond, particularly around the DevOps space. Okay, so GitLab for Education. Again, keeping in mind that you'll get this deck, uh, there are links here. Um, so the program itself has been running for uh, at, at least three years. Essentially what uh, GitLab for Education does is provide a free instance of the ultimate uh, tier or version of the GitLab software for uh, academic use purposes. Um, the details of the uh, program in terms of the, you know, the fine print is uh, available on the website. Um, just to give you a couple of quick, uh, you know, kind of uh, points on it. I'm not gonna read through this by the way, and I'm not even gonna talk to it. What I'll do is just simply, uh, pop up the next couple of slides so that you know that they're there for you to uh, dig into when you um, actually get the deck. And if you've got questions about any of the aspects of the education license program, um, there is definitely a section on the website where you can post or you can specifically direct any questions to me as well. Uh, so having gone through that, just wanted to hide, uh, highlight a few logos, hope there are no, competi no competitive uh, issues with that, James and Carita. Um, these are just some examples of some of the local organisations, local institutions that are using the free version of GitLab in their 
uh, you know, university teaching today. Um, what I wanted to do now is just close off before we move into the Q&A discussion um, by highlighting that uh, while GitLab has an education license program, we recognize that the standard commercial license just wasn't cutting it broadly in universities because you know commercially it's obviously uh, way more expensive than a lot of universities uh, budgets can afford. Um, there was recognition of that at the global level. Globally over the course of the second half of last year, uh, the company moved to a fundamentally different license pricing model so without going into all the gory details, essentially, you know, the fundamental model that you would see on the website today is user price driven. So number of users determines price. Um, what we've done is moved to a very different license pricing model for universities uh, who are going to commercially use GitLab in internal IT uh, or for other purposes. Uh, and that model is actually based on student enrollments and uh, just based on feedback I've had anecdotally with the organizations that I've socialized that model with it is certainly very palatable and I would say is uh, you know my role in this region has been to localize that global program um, particularly in the context of what I call the post-COVID reality uh, as I was explaining that phenomenon back up to the global team about why we needed to uh, arrive at a more commercially uh, feasible model in this market. So that's been achieved. We're in a great position in that we've got some uh, universities who are already looking to take advantage of the GitLab Ultimate uh, license pricing as it's been modified. I think the other thing that I want to highlight is that for all intents and purposes that license is actually an unlimited use license in terms of numbers of users that can use it. Obviously, whereas the more traditional model was very much, uh, you know, user pays, uh, numbers of users drives the price. Uh, this university model is uh, definitely not that. Okay, uh, let's move to Q&A. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, Tim, you've got that any questions from any of the participants yet, but uh, this is that, uh, that time. Um, I'm gonna start off with a question, which Tim, I didn't document in the chat, um, which is Carita, what happened with the uh, project management, uh, you know, sort of development effort um, and your client you were delivering? Yeah, I think like most clients that they're, they're interested to see the the technical technical stuff. Um, we were quite lucky that he he came to visit us quite a lot. So uh, when it came to the the management stuff of needing to you know have a production and deploy, uh, he was happy to just have a play around on our laptops. So uh, I think while he was really great, he also um, because he hadn't really pushed for us to be organized with our our management part um yeah so it did take a little bit we did have to after the project had ended we actually had to and i say we but it was mostly our strongest team member um had to go through and and make sure that it was properly deployed for him so while in terms of the project uh there weren't any major disruptions. We did have to follow up after the course had finished to, to kind of tidy up where we hadn't, hadn't really delivered. Yeah, I think I guilt tripped the team by saying, it's what professional engineers do. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I was gonna ask the hard questions, which is, did you deliver on time and on budget and was it bug free, right, you know? <laughs> Because that's that's always what the uh, the line of business the line of business uh, executives expect. They want perfect software. They want it yesterday, and uh, you know, uh, preferably free or cheap, <laughs> which is not real. I think, yeah, I think budget wise we were okay. Probably, I don't think I could one hundred percent say bug free, uh, but for the most part, um, right. yeah, for the most part delivered. I think yeah, if James hadn't guilt tripped us into sorting ourselves out post the course, we maybe couldn't say that. <laughs> yeah. I think just to 
to give a little bit of background that Karita is a little less familiar with there, um, the, the client was, and this is another thing that executives and project management people say, is that client satisfaction is actually sometimes much more important than those other aspects. And the client was very, very satisfied, um, satisfied to the extent that um, he put up a prize for the, the whole team and, uh, and gave back a little bit. He said that um, this added an enormous amount of value to his business. So this was definitely this this particular project was definitely one of our best success stories, actually. That's and, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Very good. Um, I haven't been monitoring uh, whether or not we've got uh, questions. Uh, I will poll the audience uh, one more time to see if there are any questions. Um, oh, I've got one actually, Brian. I'm going to read your question out, assuming you're still on. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you want to uh, read the question yourself, you can unmute yourself and uh, uh, ask the question yourself. Looks like Brian's not going to ask that question. I'll uh, raise it. So this is Brian Bel Belson Stanton, uh, who's actually at Macquarie University. Have either of you two had experience using GitLab with grant funded research projects? Um. Yes, for, for me, I have. Um, so there are a couple of things that, um, that I, I, I did and there just simply wasn't time to, to talk about, at least not, a, not in the, the main part about um, my use and actually our use on the staff side of, of GitLab for managing the, um, the delivery of the courses. On the grant funded side of things, yes, I, I have some grants and because I've built a skill set in GitLab, I decided it was only sensible to start managing the research using GitLab itself. But my research areas tend to be a little outside of software at the moment, or at least the, the things that I'm putting into GitLab. So I'm not necessarily using GitLab version control for keeping um, for keeping control of code, rather I have data sets um, that need to be tracked under version control. Data sets need to be processed, cleaned, um, checked for, for verification, uh, as well as all of the, you know, the myriad administrative aspects of, of dealing with, um, with grant funded research. So that's, that's my contact with, um, with grant funded research. Thank you. Um, I've got a hunch that Brian may be coming from a slightly different angle. And what I might do is connect uh, Brian with you, uh, James, uh, if you're comfortable uh, with that. Um, James, I do have a question in the absence of any of the other uh, participants having one. You touched on the uh, uh, relationship to internal IT, uh, and I think you were very generous. Um, uh, and I'm going to say that having spent considerable time talking at, uh, talking with rather both uh, uh, academics who are in your situation and university internal IT, I'd say in most instances, it appears there's a, um, a degree of tension, shall we say, between you know, what the uh, uh, academics may want in terms of the, uh, their needs and how they feel they should be supported versus what internal IT has the uh, ability to or even just willingness to, uh, you know, support. Sometimes that can be budgetary constrained. Sometimes it's actually a difference in views around what technology should be used um, I'm interested in your point of view on how you've kind of navigated that and, you know, if there were any people, uh, you know, in, from university IT, not necessarily your university, but generally, you know, representing university IT, what would your kind of messages be to them in terms of um, uh, how they would, uh, you know, best support what you're trying to achieve uh, on the, you know, faculty side? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that happened uh, actually quite a long, long time ago, before even the School of Engineering and Computer Science, back when it was the Department of Computer Science, um, is when central IT was instituted, um, a decision was made that the computer science department needed to have that IT, that tech autonomy. Um, things were just not going to work. Um, because the stakeholders of central IT are a very different and broader set and their concerns, particularly around their sensitivity to risk and compliance aspects, are very, very different to those of an academic department delivering a teaching and research program. So, um, so we 
established and, and have kept that particular separation, which has um, has led to some tension sometimes. Yes, you're right. I mean, there, there are things that um, that we want that the other party can't be reasonably expected to give, or sometimes there's just not quite the meeting of, of minds on a particular issue, uh, be it around a, a particular platform, um, or uh, whether or not you know, particular aspects of IT are going to be um, are going to be pursued. So what I would say, I guess, in my, in my ide ideal world, um, I think that having discovered DevOps and having worked for the, the past few years um, and learned a bit more in that space, I, I think that the time has come when central IT starts to take a lot more of a DevOps approach and becomes a little bit more open to, um, to interaction with the, the non-central units. Um, with the academic units. At the moment, um, just my personal feeling, for not only from this university, but from other universities that, um, that I've seen, there is quite a, an understandable, but there's a barrier between the flow of, um, of knowledge and skills and even labor. Um, you know, we have a huge pool of, uh, of students whose skills are developing day after day as they attend our lectures or, and, and complete our assessments, right? <laughs> um, so, so it, it We've got this great set of talent here that um, that the university could leverage potentially in, in a in a better way. And actually, you know, in terms of where we are in in, in the early twenty first century now, we have the technologies and we have the the frameworks that actually allow that to happen in a way that probably couldn't have happened in the past. Yeah, so, that's actually an interesting point. Um, uh, I won't mention the name of the university, but there's a university in the US who's become a very you know, kind of strong GitLab advocate, uh, both within technology and uh, at faculty. And I think the benefit that they've gained, or well, one of them they've gained, is that they have students actively working on uh, university IT projects. And so, you know, those students might be working to complete a but they're doing real work for the university. You know, and I think university IT is benefiting because it's essentially free labor. Um, if we want to take a somewhat cynical view, but it's also, you know, I think it's a, an awesome way to see the, the, the collaboration that's uh, enabled when you have that uh, cooperation between, you know, the two entities. Yeah, I, I, I hesitate to point fingers, as, uh, as you probably sense. I, I, I do honestly, though, feel that much of the problems that we have are structural. Um, and, and so it would be you know, quite unjust to point fingers, really. They're, they're historic structures that we need to break down. That's what DevOps transformations are for, right? Yeah. Right. Hey, David, it's Simon Earl here. Hey, Simon. Um, yeah, hi, Simon Earl from Integration QA. Uh, that's been really fascinating uh, from the presenters. And um, again, that, that uh, comment about uh, heroes, uh, coding heroes is, is resonating. We're doing work with a startup um, at the moment. Well, in fact, they're, they're two years past the startup at the moment up in Brisbane, Australia. And um, sometimes those heroes are accidental heroes and want to want to work them way out of a out of their um, role in the team. We've got, <clears throat> excuse me, one client that uh, they can't actually put their code into production without an individual in the in the team who's one of the founders of the business getting involved. And one of the aspects of what we're trying to do is put the structures in place to ensure that that team contribution can actually occur and having the right DevOps delivery and, and pipeline works that way. What, what other ways of, I noticed you saw the, the value stream, um, the value stream board and that sort of thing. What other ways are you looking at um, team culture for software delivery within what you're teaching, James? I, I guess my most recent experience of, um, of doing that has been that the, the good students are often the ones who are, uh, are filling that role of the, the hero coder, um, or for that matter, the, um, the hero hardware person um, who does all the electronics. And, and they shoulder a lot of the burden and, and they don't necessarily, as you say, want to operate there. They are often the, the biggest allies um, in correcting those problems in the team. And I've got a really good example of that from um, from a couple of years ago, where there was a team who were really interested in um, in DevOps, and much much of the class were they'd been reading the Phoenix project, um, and we had 
Um, it was a diverse team as they, they very, very frequently are. There were strengths, some team members had strengths in some dimensions, but not in others. And, and similarly, there were complementary skills. But it, there were two, two students who recognized that they were doing a lot of the work in one particular area and came to me and said, what are we gonna do to, um, to correct this, this problem? Because we identify this as a problem. You know, if anything happens to us or, you know, we, um, we get job offers or, or whatever, you know, the, the, the project's gonna fail, we don't want that. Um, and also place demands on them. And I said, well, look, let's, you know, let's go back to, to the, our DevOps principles uh, and back actually, you know, beyond that to, um, to principles of co-working uh, and co-location. Peer programming, making a real point of sitting people down together um, and sharing that knowledge and making sure that that knowledge is transferred between people. It's just good basic project management, and I could, could and did cite the PM Bok areas for that. Um, but also, it's in the Phoenix project as well, and it's in the DevOps handbook for that matter. Um, and so, I think those those two things are, are the ways that I've been able to to create the problems when the problems have occurred, um, or the the problem ways. One is to have the allies from the people who who are the the, the, the ones who understand the situation and understand the risks of it. Uh, and also to, to get those reference points back to, to good solid theoretical principles of good practice and good theory. Yep, yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. Thanks, James. Thanks, Simon. One last question, and then I think we need to uh, close it out. Uh, this comes from Matt Plummer, directed to Carita. Uh, how useful was your student experience using GitLab when it came to transitioning to a teaching role in the factory? Awesome faculty, factory. <laughs> awesome question. Yeah, that is an awesome question. Uh, uh, my, my experience with GitLab as a student, um, you know, while I didn't probably use it as well as I could have, uh, it definitely helped when it came to using it as a, as a teaching tool. Uh, so one of the first uh, courses that I worked on uh, when I became a, an assistant lecturer was with James on the uh, project management course. Uh, and being familiar with it uh, made it so much easier to uh, support the students in uh, figuring out what they're trying to figure out, uh, but also in being able to look out for things uh, with, like in, during the assessment. Um, assessing how many students were in the course, quite a few. Uh, we had, so we've had regularly over 100. Yeah, so, um, you know, from being one of the students to then trying to assess a lot of them of, again, overwhelming. <laughs> uh, so having the experience with the, uh, with GitLab, I was able, to, I knew what I was looking for, um, but also it's helped me uh, with other teaching courses. So I've, taught I think three different courses now um, and one of them is the DevOps course that we've been developing uh, and just being being confident in that I know how to use the tool to manage myself uh, has really helped with that uh, but I also use it for my thesis work as well so um, Paul GitLab probably have a lot of my awful repositories um, all over the place um, but yeah, having that initial experience really took the pressure off uh, becoming an assistant lecturer and helped me with a lot of that, that stuff. That's awesome, excellent. Look, uh, on behalf of everybody who joined the session today, uh, Carita and James, uh, I want to express uh, our gratitude for you being prepared to come on and share that learning experience. Um, you know, obviously, uh, personally, I'm very much looking forward to continuing to work with you and uh, um, expand uh, however we can the use of GitLab as a way to, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, continue to develop uh, interesting, exciting offerings for the university to be providing students, you know, as they then uh, head out into the workforce. So uh, thank you both very much. Uh, and for everybody who joined, thank you. Uh, just as a final reminder, uh, we will be um, uh, sending out the, uh, the content, uh, the slides that is, uh, so that you've got that to refer to. And um, if you do have any questions, then you can actually refer those directly to me. Um, uh, or if it's of a more general nature, then start at the gitlab.com uh, website 
there is a staggering plethora of information. Uh, and if you've got any decent search skills, you'll probably find what you're looking for. But if you don't, then uh, certainly feel free to ping us. Well, uh, that is pretty much a wrap. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, David, for the opportunity to speak. I'm actually very grateful for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Good stuff. All right. Thanks, everybody.